Hello. Oh. I'm Ben. And I'm Ben. We are. We are the neighbors. And have we got a surprise for you? Neighbors. Everybody needs good neighbors. With a little understanding, you can find the perfect blend. everyone super exciting today i can't wait we have got one of the neighbors royalty from back in the 90s <laughs> part of the neighbors brat pack and um, the brilliant amazing brett stark aka brett blewett Woo! Woo! <laughs> Um, I will say, I'm not sure if you can see on the screen, it says Great Race. This is a company I run with my mate. I haven't changed my name to Great Race, nor do I think I'm the greatest race. So, um, <laughs> for those We're just glad that you're not banged up in prison after causing a riot at Erinsborough High. Save our school! Save our school! Save our school! Well, this is true. After the yeah, the the I, I was I was worried because I was like, I'm not sure Brett would break into the school. So I was, when I was reading the script, I was like, oh, good. I'm glad he didn't take part in that part of it. But um, oh, I'm just your average nerd who enjoys a bit of a challenge. <laughs> no, he did. He's personally being in prison. That's a whole other story. Sounds intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> no, he ju he just started the riot and then left. He's like, oh, exactly. Hey, I'm done. See it's you later. Much. Yeah. Yes. Flew all the way in from Africa to save the yeah. school, started a riot, and then flew back. That's it. I love, too, that he just happened to be in town, you know, doing an NGO yeah. meeting, and then he heard Harris was gone. He was out there, out there with bells on. Good on him. Yeah. <laughs> Got a place to catch. Got to get going. Yeah, see you, bye. <laughs> and apparently I have a wife now. I have a wife. A Dutch yes. wife. Was the backstory. I'm not sure if I mentioned that, that that was mentioned in the script on the show, but I was just like, oh, go me. A Dutch wife. Do you think it was an older woman? Because Brett always loved the older ladies. Give me a hug. Oh, thank you. Oh. He really did get into the older ladies. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure, but let's just say yes, because that seemed to be, that's on that's on brand. No, that's what I call a tent with attitude. Oh. I loved them. Yeah, that, the storyline I had with my mum's friend, which was one of the, one of the last storylines that we had. And Carolyn Gilmer um, actually got quite sick. So she'd left the show. So I didn't even get to really play the last few weeks out with her. But Colette Mann is just hilarious and such a legend. And we just had a ball. So she came on to play my mum. My um, and that was great. So we're sort of like there was, Carolyn was really good at keeping us on track and keeping us aware of what our character would and wouldn't do to be able to, you know, dissect the scripts and, you know, speak our mind. Because quite often, when you, you, the writers are in, they, they might write for your character, but they probably don't know your character as well as you do because you've been there for a few years. So she was yeah. she was out and we should jump in there and do that. Whereas Colette was just all about the fun. Oh, this is so exciting. And the lady, Meredith Eastman, I think it's just good memory, Brett, um, played, uh, played the love interest and she was actually good friends with Colette Mann too. So, um, and then, of course, I, I just thought as a 17-year-old, you know, this is a hard thing for me to play against a 40-year-old woman, woman and, you know, and kiss her. But, of course, it was much, much harder for her. And um, <laughs> I remember the kissing scene came up and I was like, I'm just going to go for it, you know, just for full realism. And also I can't pretend in front of this 40-year-old. She'd been around. So <laughs> Did and I, and I went for it and a little bit of tongue might have just slipped in. Oh, and she stopped and freaked out. She was like, "Oh my god, oh my god!" And she had to leave the set. And everyone was like, "The crew was like, what have you done, Brett?" I was like, okay. <laughs> and then I was "Mortified." Like, Could you imagine having to kiss somebody seventeen and them doing that to you? Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah. I love at the time how we all thought like 40 was really old. It's pretty hard to imagine Judy Bergman and Brett doing anything. Brett was right. kissing Judy Bergman. 
Mum, she's not as old as you. No one asked for your opinion. Probably older than what um, that lady was at the time. And So, the big four O's coming, eh, mate? Mm-hmm. You know, in cave times, they would have just left you outside for the dinosaurs to get you. Definitely. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Approaching um, the big five. Well, I'm far, not close behind, not close. Ben's got well, a little yeah, bit. You do, you do all right. The UK and Vancouver sun seems to treat you well, Ben. Oh, shucks. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm I, really pleased. I'm really pleased that you got to have the inappropriate age relationship at that time. <laughs> that seems to be a common theme in neighbours that you have like a 17 year old and a 40 year old. And it seems to be, uh, yeah, it's fine. We'll just, um, we'll, wait, wait, we'll do that. Naughty, naughty, very naughty. It's bad. It's bad and it's wrong. It's so wrong. Naughty, naughty, very naughty. That's disgusting. Naughty, naughty, very naughty. It's completely inappropriate. Naughty, naughty, very naughty. Appropriate. That is not on. No, it's not. Naughty, naughty, very naughty. Well, uh, fancy meeting you two. Uh. Yeah. And it's like, with the, especially the UK audience, you, you wouldn't think that they were love because there's like a lot more families watch it in the UK, or at least did in the day. Um, whereas it was sort of more of a younger person's afternoon thing to sort of watch here, particularly at the time, like it wasn't it wasn't hugely popular in Australia. In fact, at a, at a, at a, that stage, they were talking about just making it for like an international audience. So you would by all rights be filming the show here, but not actually it wouldn't be shown here. So you'd be um, anonymous in a sense, so then you know, but but famous somewhere around the world would have been oh, that. Wow. <laughs> Before we go any further, I, I do have a burning question to ask. And okay. it is, it's a question that has divided the fandom ever since Brett showed up for the, the high school protest and revealed that he went to Erinsborough High with his twin sister, Danny. You've gone viral and the comments have gone berserk. Yeah, I know. Uh, Brett Stark, I used to go here with my sister, Danny, twin sister. Were Brett and Danny twins. I have been bullied online over this. People all believe Brett and Danny were twins, but I, I stand on the other side of the fence. They were not twins. Ben, you are correct. It's not true. Um, however, the, what I spoke about before about the storyliners and writers perhaps not knowing the characters as well as the characters themselves, as the years rolled on and you got new writers, um, we were sort of, it would throw the, the twin thing came into it and then different, you know, publications and stuff would describe us as twins. So we just went, um, we just said, yeah, well, we'll, uh, we'll have you not being called twins. But Eliza was actually meant to be, I think, like 14 months or something older than, than me. Danny was older than me. Oh, baby, you're just blinking, you're 18. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> we weren't in the same classes at school either but um cool. but when when we came back and then i saw that in the script my twin danny sister and i said that to him i said i'm not sure we're actually twins and they were like oh we'll be right no one will pick it up you underestimate me yet again but of course there you are <laughs> <laughs> there you go well we're glad that you're on the same page as caroline because when we met caroline she was like denial yeah. not twins <laughs> I'm going to ask from the legend herself, the, the true person that not, because she was there at birth with these two. Now, apparently they came out of my womb and I must apologise for not recalling whether I had twins or I had two births, um, but I'm voting on the side of they were born separately. <gasps> I know. I know, you'd think I would remember, but they were brats <laughs> and they caused me a lot of grief. And so I've sort of forgotten. And not twins, yeah, good, yeah. And Eliza would say the same thing, although we, we got pretty close on the first day, they sort of left us together and they were running behind by a few hours. 
so I'd never met Eliza. We hadn't we hadn't even tested together either because I was from Sydney and they sort of flew me down to test opposite um, Marnie or Debbie, and then um, and basically said, "Here's a cab charge. Go check out the city because um, we think we think you're the dork we're looking for." Um, uh, but then to meet Eliza, and then instantly within about twenty minutes, it was deep chat. We were deep. We we might as well have been brother and sister. You've got to listen to us before yeah, you start man, getting we need to mad. Talk. So cool. Yeah. So amazing how they managed to do it. We were so different, but so alike. Just very clever. Yeah, the chemistry between the Starks, the family as a whole, was just electric. You could really tell that you all gelled on screen and off screen. Um, yeah. Did, did, it, did it feel like that at the time that you were creating? Most sort of definitely. And, and like, I think um, it was much to the credit of Karen and Bill Murray. Psst. I can do without all the whispering things. This is a church, or hadn't you noticed? Yeah, no, we were praying. Oh, good. You don't need to move your lips for that. Can it? I think she she sort of had a much more... Um, you know, pronounced career than just working on neighbours as her first sort of thing. So she sort of came in it to sort of say, look, e e even if you are filming two and a half hours a week, there's no reason why it can't be great. So, um, and that was much to the dismay of, you know, some of the storyliners and often the directors too, because she wasn't, she wasn't backward in coming forward. If there was something that wasn't quite right about a script or it didn't make sense to her, she she would nut it out. So I think a lot of the directors in the end just went, whatever you do it, what? But she was, like I said, very she encouraged us to do that same thing, to take that same pride, you know, and to and to hang on to your character too. Cause I think at one point with my character, they, you know, they wanted to, I think they could see the swan, you know, underneath the ugly duckling. And so I was like, oh, maybe you should gym. We'll get you the, we'll get you a gym membership and all of that. But then Caroline was very much like, don't like you, you, you have a purpose. This character is, and that the other letters that I would get too is I, I think that my character appealed to people who perhaps didn't really fit in the, you know, the the normal mould. Do you know how many kids you could feed on the money it cost to buy that shirt? And this Japara, that could equip a whole school. Well, I just wanted you to look smart. Um, and just made them feel special. And I think that because my character was like this too, it also afforded me as an actor so many more opportunities. Instead of working at the cafe or just having a random love interest, everything was heightened and everything was different. I got to travel to Africa, you know. I had different storylines all the time and a lot of the other characters or the actors on the show wanted to work with Brett particularly because he was always quirky and always interesting, so. But what have I got in common with Annalise? What does she know about stuff? What does she know about modern art in Germany? She probably thinks Germany is some place that makes salami. Um, you know, and I'm so, and, and still to this day, people do say that, you know, when even when I went back recently and people would reach out and go, oh, he was, you know, thank you so much. He was such an uh, inspiration for me when I was a kid um, just to, to not try to be more normal, just be happy with who I am. Video games in the detention room. Don't you think the teachers are going to think that that defeats the purpose of detention? We need policies that are going to get through, man. Mm. Oh, we'll keep on going. All right. Separate study hours in the library for year 12 students only. Actually, that's not bad. Yeah, I reckon all the students will go for that one. <laughs> mm, yeah, and we can slack off with all those young kids bugging us. That's really interesting because I think that, all, uh, that obviously Neighbours has got a rich history of, like, the, the teens. You know, there's always been a teen gang for every era. But actually, they were always like, you know, it was two boys, two girls, two very good-looking boys, two very good-looking girls. And they were all sporty and... You know, there wasn't that that geek that I think a lot of the public, like you said, kind of really resonated with. And yeah. because of that, you got to work with like some of the best. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You weren't like you said, you weren't pigeonholed with the just the the teens. You were working with and Hadi, Caroline Gilmer, yeah. um, like having real strong, yeah, strong, yeah. yeah Jackie, and yeah. and I mean, even and, for a geek, for a geek, Brett was still 
still a very good looking character. Do you know what I mean? You're going to say it hard. You can say it hard. It's okay. You're, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and and for me too, like I think this is going back to Carolyn too. She was she was really she was really instrumental in me pushing that um, with as far as my character not wanting to change him. Um, even to the point where when my glasses were sort of broken and they put like Christmas wrapping, you know, Christmas tape on it, and that stayed on for like six months, you know. So it was like not only just going, let's do away with the glasses and all of a sudden Brett can see, thank God, laser surgery, and wow, look at him, he's actually a decent-looking guy. Instead it was like, no, 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 let's wrap those glasses in Christmas sticky tape, yes. So those ones are so awful. If you have to wear them for too long, we'll get them fixed. Or maybe get you a new pair. Like what? I like those thin metal frame ones. Just something a little bit more modern. Right. What is wrong with these? They give me a certain look. Well, they do that. Intelligent. Owlish, more like it. Well, you're going to have to get used to them again, aren't you? As a matter of fact, I feel more intelligent in these. <laughs> Baby. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and it really, he really was just so enjoyable, and the the African trip for me was just a real a real a real kick off because we sort of went with the executive producer and producer, and they took on the roles of um, writer, producer, and director when they were over there, and it was such a small team, but just such an amazing amazing experience to you know to have. Well, I hope you told her you were just waiting for me to grow up. Now that you're an honorary Moran, you think you're worth waiting for, huh? <laughs> loved it and I wouldn't have been able to do that unless I was Brett Stark so no no I wasn't going to ask answer, it. all the all the hot people like they were back going oh my god I can't believe you get to go to Africa this is so unfair you know <laughs> <laughs> oh and in Africa because um there's a scene that you you and Jackie filmed in Africa that is a standout moment in the in Neighbours history is when Susan confessed to killing her mum. Do, yeah. do you remember the filming that scene? It's it was oh, such um, a powerful scene. It really was, and she was, um, yeah. It, it was it was really nice to be in that moment because there wasn't many people around. You know, we had a, a cameraman who's actually a wildlife cameraman they employed over there, and then we were on a hut, so that camera was sort of just there with him, and they were a little way down this hill that we were sitting at, so it was just sort of left to us. And it was uh, it was one of the hardest scenes I've had to see because I don't have to say very much, and I didn't. You didn't want to steal anything. You just had to sort of listen. I'm working. I killed my mother, Brett. Well, I helped her to die. it was just it was a it was a huge thing in her life and uh like Jackie is just such we we had just such an amazing connection by being over there we were so grateful for the the opportunity but also she's just an awesome awesome lady and I did it because I couldn't stand to see her suffering she was in such pain Terrible pain. And I'm I'm still not sure that it was right. And she was then. There was no way. She didn't see me as an 18-year-old. She saw me completely as an equal. Um, we we laughed so much. We we really, we really got into it. It was special. But that scene in particular, yeah, still go. Oh. She made me carry this thing on my own. And the truth is, I've resented her for 20 years for doing that to me. Sometimes, sometimes I think I even hated her for it. Yeah, powerful stuff. Yeah, it was so powerful, so powerful. And I think, I guess I wanted to ask about what kind of what you learned from working with kind of the likes of Jackie, Caroline, um, and Hadi, who you were doing Tai Chi, having Tai Chi dates with in the in the front lawn. Um, and um, what were they like to work with? 
Yeah, and I think, you know, sort of Anne Hattie had, you know, been around for years. Carolyn, I've mentioned before. Jackie had done other shows as well. I'd actually come off like a, a sitcom that I'd done for a couple of years before, Neighbours for me. Um, so I'd had a little bit of experience, but it, it is a different, I think people can be harsh with Neighbours too, which is why when it finished, um, before it got brought back, it was just so amazing to see so many actors express such gratitude and come back into the throw, you know, and the likes of, you know, Guy Pierce coming and going, no, I want to do that. And then even when that started up again, he, he, you know, just the integrity of the guy where he was like, I can't just leave the storyline. I have yeah. to be in it to wrap it up. You know, yeah. it's like, mate, you're doing Hollywood films. You don't need to. But I think it, it's, it's a really amazing learning ground uh, as far as, you know, etiquette and studio etiquette and understanding how how things work and but in such a fast pace as well not all directors could be soap directors one of my good mates um directs now for for home and away and he's been doing it a long time but it's 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 you've got to be great with the, your young actors and you've got to be able to bring them out of their shell and give them the performance direction that you need but it's so technical because you're dealing with a crew who really just want to get home um, they're, they're, you know, they're passionate about it too, but at the end of the day, it is nine to five. It's been going for 15 years. It's just a job. So you've got to tick both boxes. And, um, and it was, was amazing to do it. But going back to what you talked about before, the specific actors that I got to work with who were, who were all, it was just, I was just, um, so grateful for that because yeah, they've been around the bush. What did you go and do that for? What for? Uh, oh, Brent, it's perfect. I don't want to go. Annalisa's got the travel bug. I'll pay you for it. I know you want it. I don't expect to get it for free. You don't understand. I have given that ticket to Helen. To Helen? Yes, Helen. And, and she said, yes, that's who I want to take. Oh, Brent, darling, I think that this Harold and Maud thing you've got with Helen is one. No, Mum, she's my friend and they're my tickets. Um, but it also taught me, you know, there was a lot of things I remember just of life. And just advice, one of the best advice is that, you know, I was worried, you know, because we're going out and then I was going out and I had a big day the next day and we're out and then Jackie was like, it's okay. All you're going to be tomorrow is tired. Um, and maybe it was the best bit of advice, but also the worst bit of advice I could have ever got because I've done that through my whole life. And just, you know, I'll be fine. I'll just be tired. Let's keep going. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, I, I think it was, you know, it was the combination of people who've been there for a long time, but also the, of the older actors who did get to bring bring a lot as well. Um, and I thought I thought Brett was quite irreverent and he was a really fun character to play. Yo, Funsters, this is Brett Stark coming to you live from Burbank, California, where the stars are just beginning to arrive. Oh, no. Um, yeah, you could, I, I could just take risks and, you know, I could throw big offers out there. And most of the time, directors were like, "Yes, we we'll run with that. That's great." Did you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite storyline for for Brett? Africa was was pretty awesome with that yeah. one too. But I think my my most favorite was the when he was trying to woo Debbie Martin. Yeah, yeah, there's something wrong with the bike. The brakes are a bit stiff. I can handle it. <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> when did you stop smoking? Oh, it's been a while. I can't remember. Oh, didn't know that. <laughs> Here you go. So, it's gone down. <laughs> Just you at the moment. Maybe you should give up. Yeah, it's not doing you much good. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you say that? You're not exactly handling it very well, are you? Oh, no, I can do anything. <laughs> and, um... And he went all out and mum was away for the weekend and she said, use the credit card for emergencies and he booked a fancy restaurant, a helicopter flight, the whole the whole thing. Aaron, how can you afford all this? <laughs> Never you mind, you just concentrate on enjoying yourself. Yes. Uh, and, yeah, and, and, and Marnie was really good at playing it. We were good friends too, but... There was there was that element of like art, life imitated art, not in the sense that I was like lusting after her. And it's not you. I think you're really nice, but I'm just not interested in a relationship at the moment. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand totally. Oh, good. But she she'd been around a while, and I was sort of a new character. And I think she always knew it was going to play that. And she's she was a great actress. She's a she was awesome as far as the young ones when we moved on she was the one that I sort of looked up to and went you're great I want to work with you and thankfully we got to 
So we, it was it was just really clever during that whole courting period because even in normal life, she sort of, you know, not turned a cold shoulder, but just made me try a lot harder than I sort of needed to. It was like, great. So it sort of, um, it, it, that played off into it as well. And it was just, just funny. And, you know, I don't have these old episodes on VHS or anything like that. So um, when they were sort of, uh, sometimes there's recordings you can find people send me stuff and I'm like oh my god I want to watch that and then I do and then <laughs> yeah. it's been picked up and that Amazon was going to put all the old episodes up and I was like well that's me for the next four years I'm just going to watch them um, but as it turned out it was, I think it was only 80 episodes of all time and of which I was in the couple so yeah. um, it's still to watch them and look back and it's surprising how much I don't remember. So you're, you're, talking, you're talking about Debbie as well as, as as one love interest, but for me, I remember the most was your um, kind of lusting after Libby. Uh, actually, I was going to help Libby move the piano. Yeah, just opening the wall. <laughs> well, totally me stop you. Okay. Can I just <laughs> I think it's time you two went home, don't you? Oh, for sure. And met, met myself and Kim, like, we went to the same kids' drama school and she was part of the whole show group, so she danced and sang and she'd done um, dozens of, like, television commercials before that as well. Um, and so, yeah, when we... The, the sitcom that I'd done for a couple of years, she actually played my sister... sitcom and uh and you know true Australian form I actually kissed her on that sitcom before I kissed her on Neighbours <laughs> no, was like, she was like my she was like my half sister so the premise of this tv show was called My Two Wives and it was a guy that that, that uh had his ex-wife move into an apartment downstairs with his two kids and I was I was the older brother of the two kids and then, um, but living upstairs, of course, was was was, was Kim, um, his his daughter, uh, and with his you know his, his his daughter with his other wife. Anyway, so it was this big messed up family. But Danny, we've got to talk. It's him. He's here. He's mine. Danny, shut up. More old world charm, Jack. <laughs> you stay out of this, Lisa. She needed to practice how to kiss. So Danny, another character, said, "You have to just practice on Jack." And then, yeah, <laughs> that's that's what that's true. With so the when Kim, is anything good? The <laughs> it's, 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 oh no! Apparently it's not. Oh, it's never going to be. But but when Kim came to do, because I actually took her to the Logies the year before she started, um, and then yeah, she called me and she was like, "Oh my god, I got a part on a new show because we'd done our show for a couple of years." And I was like, "Oh wow!" And she goes, "It's shooting in Melbourne." And I was like, "That's amazing! How come it's the show?" And she goes, "It's your, sh it's Neighbours." And I was like, "What?" And she goes, "I'm your new love interest." Yeah, right. Watch out, Libby. I'm gonna make you mine. When we and then it was just like, whoa. Um, and it, it's what it's funny how some things stick too. So like people will see me, not so much these days, but like when they did, they look at me and go, I recognize you from somewhere. And then you sort of tell them what it was. And they're like, that's right. Oh, and Libby kisses like a wet fish. And um Paul. <laughs> Yes, you have a Kim, like, she just copped that everywhere. It was just some little lie. I might have even ad-libbed it, but we didn't even think very much of it at the time. Libby Kennedy is wetter and colder than a fish. <laughs> and then, you know, so she's she's spent the last 20 years um, trying to, you know, dispel that rumour. We just re we just resurrected it again. Wetter and colder than a fish. Okay. For the record, she does not kiss like a wet fish. She kisses like a dry fish, actually. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you, do you keep in contact with Kim? I do. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Kim, uh, she's doing a lot of 
like advocacy work at the moment for you know domestic violence uh, against women, which is a, a big cause and something close to my heart too. Um, and yeah, we, we've 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 remained friends throughout time. We you know sometimes we can go eight months and we won't chat with each other, but um, but she you know she's pretty good at it too, and she's a mum now. And um, I've watched her daughter grow up. Kim was in Sydney when I was in Sydney and I was best mates with his her partner and we would jam together and I would look after her daughter. And then there's I started a business with a mate and Kim's actually worked for that business for small periods of time when she's like had a tiny bit of time. I was just going, sorry, I've got another gig. And I was like, that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah. she's, a, she's a very open and real human. Yeah, I think what you see is what you get with Kimmy, which is awesome. Yeah. And you can't not like we we started so young together, and it was both those shows as well. So, darling, she still has a place in your heart, doesn't she? Yep. I mean, that you've worked. We've mentioned all the the greats that you've worked with, but we've haven't mentioned one. Dull. This is the other member of the family you haven't met yet. Ah, yes, this is Brett's mate. You know, one bird brain to the other. Ah, ha, ha. His name's Dar. Dar the oh, Lark. Oh, dog game started on Neighbours Pets, please. <laughs> <laughs> Dar, 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 Dar was on that show for four times longer than I was, I do believe. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of people will be like, you know, people go, you're on Neighbours. Yeah, what character did you play? And I was like, you know, Dahl the Bird? Yeah, I was his original owner. You know, that's how I describe myself. Brett, 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 you wouldn't be missing our little princess from Cruella, would we? Yes, as a matter of fact. Oh, look, try and look on the bright side of him. He may not be as good a kisser, but unless you got Kula. You're right, thanks. Um, and yeah, it was a gift given from Lata. Wow, great buddy. Lata. <laughs> Here's the bread. Oh, oh, great. Cool. Oh, oh. No. <laughs> yeah, there's two bird brains in the family. Because they were figuring which way to go with Brett. And um, I think there was a there was a chat with this, there was a storyline with the um a chat with the storyliners, and they were talking about perhaps making you gay. Um and I was just that little bit too young. And in retrospect, I would have liked to have done it, just to trial it. But um, I think there, there was a, not Beverly Hills 90210 or Melrose Place, I think it was, and they had a gay character on it. Yeah. Um, and but that was that was groundbreaking at that point. And um, it was also, a, you know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't so much a family show. It was very much set for people in their 20s to 30s who probably a bit more open and accepting of it. So good on Neighbours for wanting to take a risk with it. Yeah. But, yeah, sorry, back on the Dal thing, Lata, she was my girlfriend at the time, and I remember I got really, really sick. This, this I, I will talk forever, and I do apologise, guys. I go off on the tangents. But oh. before I got really, really sick, we had an appearance at, like, a basketball stadium and there were like 30,000 people there and I felt myself getting tired I was like I'm going to rip myself up I'm going to make an entrance and they called my name and they also gave us a little promotion hat so instead of putting it on I had it in my hand because I decided I was going to do a round off and then I ran on and I did this round off <laughs> and the hat slipped from underneath my hand and I face planted in front of 35 and they all were like ooh and I was like oh God. and at the end <laughs> Mum was like, what were you doing? Because she was there in the other room. So I was like, I'm trying to do a round off. But then I've got the hat, the hat in my hand. And it was just so embarrassing. <laughs> I just got upstairs to have a drink. And I said, no, I just want to go home, Mum. I'm, I think I'm pretty sick. And then we we te I tested for glandular fever. So that storyline then had to get cut down to like next to nothing because I also couldn't make contact. But it was Brett's coming of age, you know. <laughs> That was, it was meant to be his first passion, the whole thing. But as it worked out, because I was contagious, you know, and I, I so when we when we had to do the love scene that her her brother Vikram, I love that all this comes back, Vikram walked in on, we were meant to be kissing. <laughs> that was enough to ship to India and uh, yeah but yeah. she was such a cool chick too I loved her we I'm... I hate photos what are you doing yeah, only ones of yourself I bet yes yeah, wait, wait 
Let me see. It hasn't developed. No, I wait, promise wait, you. Wait, I'll take a look. You know, because like for her, that was like a good six week solid storyline stint, which through my sickness resulted in a massive scene cut. So I felt bad for her too, but. You didn't scene. have much luck, did you, with the um, with the kissing scenes? Did you? Did you? <laughs> that glandular fever, oh, yeah. and forty year old. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> accidental <laughs> time. Yeah, <laughs> and they were like, "No more kissing, Brit. Yeah, you're gone. You're done." Brit right, Stark. What? You know how I always thought he was a total dweeb. Yeah, I was wrong. Totally wrong. After tonight, I reckon we're made for each other. The way he kissed me on stage, it's incredible. It just blew me away totally. What? Starkers? <laughs> and uh, obviously the, the family of the Starks started off quite small, but then it got bigger with the introduction of, of Marlene, and then mm. Sam Kratz came into it, and obviously we had Darren, who'd been in it before, but then was recast and brought back. How did it feel being part of, like, such a, a dynasty of the family <laughs> within the sub. Yeah, it was good to see that. And it was uh, interesting enough, Tom McDonald is now lives in Brisbane, around the corner from me. So we haven't actually caught up yet, but we keep going, we've got to catch up. Um, and he was on when I came back, but not really on when I was there. And then Scott Major, who's a director now, had also acted in Heartbreak High back in the early days. So sort of knew him as well and saw him last time I went out there as well. Yeah, and I love that Kratz is actually stark backwards. That took us about two years to realise. What? Oh, oh my god, mind blown. Oh. That is, that's so wow. obvious. Yeah. Oh wow. I'm not sure it's felt the same, but it but it is it's the sound thing when it comes out. Yeah. And then when they told us, I was like, oh yeah, okay, you sneaky little rise. So <laughs> um, but I love that. And Richard, who played Sam, he was just such a great guy too. And we would laugh, we would laugh a lot. And um and uh, Jesse Spencer who played Billy on Natives as well like yeah, the three of us were, were pranksters and quite often we'd just be ganging up on each other to try to do the ne the next big prank. Hey, hey. what's this? Mate, Kennedy. Thought you'd be used to bulls charging you by now. Get lost. It's that stench. I think you must have trod in something before you left that farm. Hey guys, get out of here. I'll try to find a brain to share as you go, will you? Um, so I did, yeah. And it was nice to see the family growing, like I said. Part of, a, part of a bigger picture. Uh, Definitely. Moya O'Sullivan, um, Marlene Kratz, she was, she's one of my all-time favourite characters. Like... <laughs> what, what was she like to work alongside? Oh, she was just lovely. She was, she, what you see is sort of what you got with her too. Because <laughs> she was just, you know, she was like just so lovely and warm. Look, you've been doing so well so far. Yes, but I can't do it, Nan, okay? I've tried. He can sort out his own problems. But what about if Darren can't sort out his own problems and he ends back in jail? Oh, you don't want that, do you? And I think that's the thing too, is like that most of the, the the older characters on the show, they just were just so grateful to be there. And, you know, it was sort of like our time to shine. So we'd be the rat bugs running around the the, the green room, not learning our lines and getting into trouble. They were, they were just there to go, oh, look at them. This is, they're the future. Go for it. <laughs> um, but yeah, she 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 was love and I, and uh, I had a man vibe. Probably not the same sort of vibe as I had as Caroline as a mum. Mum, de Caroline definitely felt like a mum. Can't have every little thing you want in life. Oh, enough with the smart remarks. You're still the kid, remember? Um, you know, and you know, she'd ask about you and how you were, and if you're having a hard day, you'd be going around for dinner, and that was there was no ifs and buts about it. You were kind of intrinsically, you were the first person to kind of almost see Harold back on Ramsey Street when he came back as Ted. You've got Darren to thank for that, you know. Yeah. Don't even know how he found us. Didn't know where we were myself. <laughs> like, yeah. what was the kind of buzz like backstage and about the return of, like, Magic Harold at that time? Yeah. For, for me, I think I'd left the show and then I came back just for a six-month week since. So I just felt super blessed because I used to watch Neighbours and loved it. And Harold was like one of my most favourite, favourite characters. So it was so cool to be met with what you, you know, who you'd grown up with and watched on screen so much. 
Uh, what's the name of the street? Ramsey Street. Ramsey Street. And he was just such a comedic character and also a very strong character similar to Brett Stark. So it was pretty nice when, when I got to meet him. And he's also really funny. He's like, he, he does it. He's not like Harold at all in real life. He's, he's a very, very funny person. Um, and so, yeah, that there's one particular scene that I think is on one of the ones that they've sort of put on Amazon. And I was like, I, I remember that. I just remember laughing the whole way through that scene. <laughs> Yeah, do you need to know how to get back out on the main road? No, 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 no. I have a street directory in the van. <laughs> Thank you, though. <laughs> That's OK. <laughs> See ya. Ramsey Street. And it was quite a serious scene, but, um, yeah. And at that time, you Brett had come back for Cheryl's funeral. Oh, Brett! Hey. Oh, how are you? Good. Hmm? No. It's been awful. Yeah, I know. Oh, wow. I'm so glad you're back. Because Cheryl was yes. killed by Carl Kennedy in his lethal injection at the scene of the, the car car accident. Oh, what's that? It's morphine. Just a very small dose. Were you not outraged that Cheryl had been killed off when you came back to the show? Because uh... I was. Because you were outraged that Cheryl had been killed off. Um, I, I think by that stage, like, I'd had good friends like um, Brooke and Jess who were on it who were, like, stoked to sort of get me back. Um, and then Kim was there too and they were like, yay. And um, I, I knew for Caroline she only had a limited amount of time that she wanted to do it as well. Um, and for me, that was a similar thing. And, and one of the men who's uh, passed now but who was the executive producer, he'd sort of come up with concept for a new show and there was a character in there for me with it. I think Caroline was trying to get something off the line with like a, a, a show in arms. It was like a spin-off of, of Neighbours, but much like Ab Fab, where my character would be the one rubbing, running the pub pretty much and she just got drunk, and but it was actually her pub. Um, so and and I'd got back from Africa, so it sort of sort of hit ahead. It was two and a half or three years, and then I think I think my times I think my times and I'd already done two years on the other show, uh, on another show as well. So I was like ready for new things. Um, so I totally got where she was at because I think that Carolyn was sort of at that point too. But then because she got sick, she didn't quite get to the point where she wanted to. So I understood from a from the actor's perspective. Um, but there wasn't really much a part of it for me that went, oh, well, if my mum's dead, I guess there's no chance of me coming back. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was sort of, you know, keen. and then as it turned out, it was only like oh, literally around that time, probably when I came back on that I'd, I'd sort of, you know, decided to go overseas to England and sort of take a step back from acting a little bit just to, just to you know, I think I'd, I'd been doing it, been so involved in it since I was a little kid. Uh, and doing hours and hours of acting classes a year and then 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 being so lucky enough to be on TV and then getting a character like, you know, Brett Stark was awesome too, but I just found that when I then went for auditions, I sort of felt like people just didn't accept me as an actor. They just saw me as Brett Stark. <laughs> and one young director pretty much said about as much um, and he was like, so what makes you feel like, you know, they were like, didn't you play that door for neighbours? And I was like, yeah. And the character was like a um, someone who, you know, had a lot of problem with violence and drugs. And he goes, and so what makes you feel like you could play this character? And I was like, because, because I'm an actor. And I'm like, yeah. oh, that? And then he was like, well, let's see what you can do then. And I was like, oh, I probably just got angry at him. So I probably pushed way too far. But that was, that was actually a point for me. I left that audition. I was like, you know what? might be time just to do something different for a little bit. And so that's what I did. And then, then each path leads to a new path and blah, 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 now I'm at where I'm at. Interestingly, oh. I found a video of you on YouTube do, doing your first stand-up gig. You heard my name, Brett Blewett. Yes, that is my last name. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, good night. <laughs> oh, no, no, not really. Seven. Oh, months. wow. I, it, it, was, it was seven months ago, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was, and that's it was awesome. very funny. Oh, thank you very much, yeah. Um, I think I, yeah, because it, it's that whole thing of always, like, pushing yourself and stand up something that I've always wanted to do but not not do. I never have never wanted to do it. But, um, but also 
I, I just thought, it's, why am I so afraid of it? It's silly. And since leaving Natives, I've worked with theatre and education. I've written shows about, you know, issue-based shows about bullying and conflict resolution and body image. And I did that for several years. And then um, I've started a corporate team building company with a mate. And we do, um, we do pretty well. We're represented for every state in Australia and we run about 650 events a year. So it's sort of become, that's our baby. That's what I do now. And so... But finding the time, because even that, after doing that for now nearly 15 years, you end up getting stuck and things become easy. Um, and getting up in front of a group of people and talking is something that's always sort of come easy to me. But then to get up in front of a group of people and try to be funny, that's a different thing. Because what if they don't think you're funny? What if you die? Yeah. What if they start chucking things at you? Um, <laughs> and so I was, <laughs> it was great. I was so nervous. And you don't know when you write whether or not something's funny or not. And the more you say it, the less funny it is to you. And I remember the day before, I was like, there is not a single moment of laugh. I can't imagine where they're going to laugh here. Wow. And then the, the the course that I sort of did, she was like, this is great. Keep it in. Keep all the naughty bits in as well. <laughs> like, look at gay sides. What do we call that? We call it manhunt. <laughs> yep, you've got scruff. You've got grinder. Exactly. Yes! Why? Yes! You're on there. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Why in the fuck would you name a gay dating site after a fucking power tool? Um, so, and then when I jumped out there and got up, it was just really fun. And if I'm to be fair, it was a very favourable audience. Like, they get primed up because they know that this is all of our first time jumping up and doing stand-up. And so they were all very, very kind with the laughing. So even if it wasn't funny, you just assume it was because everyone was laughing. But... <laughs> no, it, genuinely, it, it was funny. The, the joke about your nan. And I had to share with my brother. And he was five years older than me. This one night we had this huge argument and uh, he cracked the shits, I cracked the mum, cracked the shits and I got sent to bed early. 6.30 it was. I was only seven, but that was early. And I woke up in the middle of the night. My brother had found his bed. And so um, he was snoring. Like, he's always snored, but he was snoring louder than he'd ever snored before. And I was fucking pissed at him. So I looked at my bedside table and there was a tennis ball. And I was like, right, here we go. And I threw it at his head. And it was like, chock, bounced off. But he kept on fucking snoring. <laughs> so I got out of bed and I walked over to him. And with all my seven-year-old might, I punched him as hard as I could in the back of the head. <laughs> and when he rolled over... I realised it wasn't him, it was my nan. <laughs> it's a true story. You know, I've got a thousand of them too. It's really funny too, because like you realise with stand-up, because I think that's it. I've got a, I've got a billion and one stories. Um, and the, the issue is that they generally involve people who are still alive or, you know, there is divulging it. My mum was really in the audience, so that was the first time I told mum that story. But so much of what you write, you then realise, oh, shit, they could come, they might watch. But also in the day of the internet, uh, you know, in the interwebs, and that can be all out there, anyone can see anything. So, yeah. um, and, you know, it gets shared by somebody and blah, blah, and then all of a sudden your stepbrothers who we haven't spoken to for years and then your stepdad sees it. You know, I'm so glad I didn't come out and say some of the things that I said. And obviously from a performer's perspective, you, you've got to come back and be part of the, the reboot of Neighbours. Um, yeah. And... I guess, what was it like stepping back into kind of Brett's world, into Brett's shoes after such a long time away from the show? Yeah, I think um, it was like from a storyline perspective, I mean, it, it could have gone so many different ways. It was, just, it was a very basic storyline. And if, if anything, it was sort of more, um, you know, just telegraphing who I was to those that didn't know. Uh, Brett Stark. I used to go here with my sister, Danny, twin sister, back in the 90s. Kick around with uh, Malcolm Kennedy, Libby Kennedy. You might know their mum, Susan. Uh, yeah. yeah? <laughs> Great. So it was sort of just like retelling the, the, the paragraph of my story. Brett, since leaving Erinsborough High, you've had a really adventurous life that's ultimately ended up in Africa. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I live there with my wife. We live in Tanzania. We run a non-for-profit, which is all about providing solar power solutions to remote communities. It's amazing. But seriously, if it wasn't for this school, I wouldn't even be there. How so? Well, when I was a student here, I won an opportunity to travel to Africa with my teacher, the amazing Susan Kennedy. 
But from a from out of the performance side of things or having anything made to sort of buy it onto, going back to that studio where I spent so much of my formative, so much time in my formative years and and thank God the walls can't talk there either. But still just looking at those walls going, thank God you can't. <laughs> um, it was really cool, and then then a lot of the a lot of the crew was still there, not heaps of them, but it, but a lot. Um, it felt much smaller. Maybe I was little then. I, I mean, I definitely was, but um, it was just it was just interesting to be back in that world, you know, and be surrounded. And that's the same studio that they filmed in twenty five years ago, and have done from the start. Yeah. Um, that was that was incredible. And looking at all the old photos, and I ran into. Jackie and Ryan and Scott Major as well. It was just like, oh wow, hi. You know, even Rebecca M. Logley, when I first started out, me and Kim went to the same drama school as her. And oh. her yeah, Rebecca's uh, like brother, he used to do a show called GP. So the M. Logleys were were there in force. So it was like, oh my God. And she was like, yeah, like a man. <laughs> <laughs> And how did that return come about? What when you got the the call to come back? Like, how did that feel? Um, yeah, it was great. I think uh, like towards the end of last year when they were going to wrap things up, um, they basically I think they reached out to lots of people. So I was someone said, "Would you be keen?" And I was like, "I'm interested." And then I think when they when they went to film that final episode, I don't I don't think they really understood the the response they get. From, from the caliber of, of actors that they did. So the likes of me were sort of like, oh, bad luck, bye, thanks. <laughs> thanks for coming. Really um, I know, right, how rude, but, you know, there's a reality to it. And then um, uh, I'm no guy, Pierce, let's let's put it that way. Uh, but then, of course, when they opened up the, then to do the next next series, um, then they were, then, they, then I sort of, and they reached out and got, a, you know, quite a few of the old ones back too, which was great. So it was nice, you know, and it was just like, and, and like I said, just a break from what I'm doing. I really love what I do, but I've done it for 15 years now. So um, it's not something that I'll ever want to let go of because I do love it, but it's nice to do little things on, on top that just something to look forward to. It was super fun seeing everyone again. Um, and then, you know, and then then the the fanfare where it all went to air, you know, from the likes of you guys as well. It's just sort of like you just go, oh, and, you know, when people reaching out on Instagram or thing and sending private messages, you're like, that's so, so cool that people remember. That's really sweet. But yeah. I think that it's, it, I mean, the, the Starks were such an iconic family from back in the day. As teenagers, kind of like te you grow up with your kind of, collective teams on the soap so you kind of watching along as they grow up and you kind of looking up to them as well so you're in our homes five days a week 365 days a year so it's yeah. it you know you become part of someone's kind of culture and their zeitgeist so it's huge it's huge so for us as fans to kind of see you back on the show was like oh my god it's very bloody sock yeah and and I think that that genuineness really comes through. And you know, I I love my country and the Australian culture is great in many ways. But there is that what they call that sort of tall poppy thing. Not that I was a massively huge poppy. It's more the fact that you know there's 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 a it's it's cool to not celebrate it. So even amongst my friends, like they you know I didn't tell too many people, but then it sort of came out and they were like, oh how hilarious, you know. And then they'll send they'll record something little and then send me it and repeat in some sort of meme, and I'm like, ah, you know. Whereas it's really nice to then, you know, be be met with such. And one of my friends who's here from the UK, I didn't actually tell her and she didn't know until last night. And someone, I mean, a couple of nights ago, but we're at a barbecue and then some friend brought it up and she goes, you did what? And I was like, I, I went back on it. It was like for a, a, a half a scene. And then she was like, why wouldn't you tell me? Oh, my God, that is so amazing. And she, she meant it, you know. And I was like, it's so genuine. And the other people at the barbecue didn't know how to react. So they were like, oh, calm down. Wow, fangirling much? But it's like, no, it's, it's, uh, that's, you know, I love Australia in, in, and, um, you know, our culture in so many ways. But I think we can be a bit more supportive of, of people, you know, um, and, and I think that our, our general go-to is to sort of rip them down just a little bit, just in case, just in case they think they're, they're a little good. So I really appreciate the, the positive feedback. It's cool. uh, 
genuinely, genuinely. Um, also, we couldn't um, kind of interview you today without doing a bit of a tribute to um, Troy Beckwith, who um, has, it's just been announced has sadly passed away this weekend. Um, obviously, you worked with Troy um, during your stint in Nervous. Um, are you happy to share some of your kind of memories of Troy? Yeah, definitely. I think when we sort of started, there was already a little black rat pack there. It was Marnie who played Troy's sister. And then there was um, Dan Bowsen as well. Oh. And, um, oh. and then Tony. And uh, I know he was like, oh, <laughs> um, oh, no, no. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll let you two sort it out. And fun and a little entrepreneur too, but. Um, they were quite good friends, um, Dan and Troy. And then Troy, because I'd moved from Sydney down to Melbourne, uh, I didn't know anybody. So I was quite quite young. So he was he was close to my age, his birthday. We actually shared the same birthday and he's exactly a year older than me. Um, so that sort of got us in. And unlike his character on the show, he was, he was much more quiet, reserved, super, super charming, super empathetic, genuine, person i'm quitting the team you can't who are we going to replace you with I'll get one of the juniors they do a better job i mean even your sister plays like a pro compared to me look it is too late to replace you you're just going through a temporary loss of form but you'll find it again we're all counting on you mate great that makes me feel a whole lot better so fast forward a year or so afterwards and we'd go out and say if we went to a bar or something like that we almost always got into a fight and it wasn't his fault. It was just that boys would actually see him and then go, oh, because, you know, he wasn't ugly. And um, and they just assume he was a tough character too. So, like, they would actually just randomly take swings. Whereas with me, I was the cheeky one. I was the one that you should have actually been punching. So have a go. What? Come at me. No. Mm. Bet. We got the practice. Come on. Knock it off. Come on, uh, you're history stark. I'll be stonefish, all right? You're, you're history stark. You're gonna come, but you're gonna die. Cut it out, Michael. It's not funny. Come on, you. Knock it off. That's worm. Look, still go harder. Come on. Now, get him low. He can't have a good swing at you, all right? So he's got longer arms. Now, all right. Let's try it again. Harder. Come on. Come on, stark. Oh. Um. Sorry, Michael. I'm, I'm just trying to do what you told me. Um, but because I played a lovable dog, they were like, and I was no threat to them and their girlfriends, they'd be like buying me a beer. So I'd be like going to <laughs> second free beer and they'd be like, we've got to go, we're going to fight. I was like, ah, damn it, Troy! Well, I warned you, star. I was just going. Huh? You've upset Sassy. Now you're going to pay. Uh, look, I, I swear to you, I, I, I've done nothing. I was just explaining to Sassy that she has the wrong idea. I'm not interested in that. I, I would not stand in the way of you two. No way. So let's just let bygones be bygones and, uh, and keep our teeth. Is that true, Sassy? Don't be useless piece of dirt. <laughs> <laughs> but he really took me, he took me in and he took me out to his mum's sister's house and I got to know, um, yeah, the whole family. He lived out at Berwick, sort of like on, the, on a farm, sort of farm, like sort of rural area. Um, and then his friends as well. And and Jada Mentor, who was on the episode that I was in as well, she told stories of, you know, not that I can remember a lot of it, but she told stories of us going out as well. And I was like, oh, wow. Um, and then through the years, Troy, when I lived in Sydney, moved up to Sydney, so we'd hang out intermittently then as well. But he just was, um, he read a lot. He was deepful. He was deeply thoughtful. He was insightful. Um, and just a really, if he was there for you, he was there for you. He was sort of a big listener in the room too. Um, if you got him in the giggles, he had the best laugh in the world. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, that's just just what, what happens. And I uh, know he was fighting two types of cancer and that's what happened in the end. Well, so, he... He will always be remembered by the neighbors community because his character was so legendary. Like to turn up and try and kill your stepmom by drowning her in the spa and uh, I'll always remember him, his character breaking out of prison dressed as a woman. How do I look? Oh, I know I'm not going to win any beauty pageant or anything, but will I fool the guard in the gate? 
trying to stop um save Debbie Martin from I, I your remember that myself. brother. I think that was before, just yeah. before your time when Darren Stark number one was in it and he'd led yeah. Debbie astray and they were holding up a police um a petrol station. So yeah, I'll, yeah, he'll always be remembered by us. He was a, a fabulous character. Yeah, a fabulous character and just an awesome human, you know. Um, and and well beyond his years, like understanding where I was coming from and what I, and what and he was like, nah, this 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 guy needs a big brother. Chaos theory, the story of my life. Things happen to me that are totally beyond my control. I'm at the mercy of forces greater than any of us. Oh, give it a break, will you? Yeah, well, Sashi won't keep away from me. So, so I'm a dead man. And so that's what that's what he was to me in those first couple of years as well. So, yeah, it was a bit of a shock when Kim Kim sort of reached out in Valentine and said to myself and Eliza a message and I know that she's sort of friends with his, some of his friends and his sister still and so yeah she was like hey just letting you know this has happened probably going to hit the news at some stage and I was just like wow ah, damn it yeah times sad times yeah get out there live your life people do what you want because it just goes yeah and I think that leads on a little bit to my next question actually is just that what advice would you give to young Brett Blewett who is like stepping onto um, Ramsey Street for the first time. Yeah, I guess I, I guess it was probably it was probably don't trust trust who trust who you are as a person and stay true to yourself. Because um I think that even by being on on a show with, where you do have and the same sort of thing with home and away, I think you've got you know there's so many an emphasis is put on how you look. Um and by, by no means, like now I look back and I look at photos of me when I was a kid and I was like, I was a good looking boy. I was that, like, I was not a dork, but I think that I had the concept of my character reinforced by the public then assuming that that was the case. And that's what I then told myself. So it took me a long time to sort of own my own skin. And I would dare say it wasn't until my sort of mid thirties that I actually would look in the mirror and go, you're right, dude. You got this going on. There's someone there for you. But I think that I I I would just say to the young young Britons, like you know, be proud of who you are and stay true to yourself. And I think I have because you know, attractiveness doesn't just come from you know, it's not just skin deep. And I'm really proud of the person that I am and what I represent to a lot of people as well. So I'm I'm stoked with that. And I might have lost my way with that slightly when I left and struggled to find my place in the world. Um, and I'd only wish that I'd found it found it sooner. So that would be my advice to listen. Wise words. Wise words. <laughs> um, do you think there's any chance of another Brett Stark return? I don't I don't know. Um I don't know. I think the 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 producer that's on there at the moment. I know he was a big Neighbours fan from back in the day, and there's the the guy that does their social content also a massive fan and was just hugely honoured to be working on the show. And it was really beautiful to see um, because, like I said, when there's a crew, when your crew you've been working on there for 15, 20, 25, 30 years, it just becomes a job. Um, and when you work on other shows, especially new shows, everyone's a bit excited and there's that element. So to have that new blood with those producers and, you know, I know that the, um, you know, the digital producer just does such an amazing job of getting so much out there and super, super passionate. Um, so I wouldn't say no. I think if they, if, I wouldn't say no if they said, hey, do you want to come back and do a little bit of a synth again? Um, and there's a possibility of that just because, like you guys, they're fans of the show throughout the the generations. But I think most of the writers, and honestly, like um, I mean, I'm assuming, but most of the new audience members wouldn't really know who I was was either. And I think you know there will be a time. I I'm doing what I do do now because it's, you know I've sort of made uh, you know it's made set myself up and it's made me money. Um, but there does come a time too where you're like, I don't want to be doing this until I retire. Like you want to, I like with the stand up thing or the impro thing. I always want to try new things, and I love traveling and I love doing that. So, um, you know, and I've always said the way I see myself retiring is to get a role, like to start back where I to finish off where I started, and get a role on a soap, play a play a fun dad or a or a grandpa if it's that's the age that it has to do. And if I can rock up to every to work every morning and just play. Um, and then and and then that's how I go and I can be there until I'm 80, then how beautiful would that be? Because I definitely don't want to 
not worth it all. And that was Anne Hattie. Anne Hattie, she was, she's always told me, she was like, I'm never leaving, that I will die on the scent, you know? <laughs> yeah. Brett and his Dutch wife could move on to Ramsey Street with their kids. They must have like teenage kids. Yeah, Perfect. for sure. Well, yeah, how old was I? Yeah, that would, would actually make sense. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, with the way neighbours ages, they could be 64. You know, you'd never... Yeah, this is true. <laughs> you don't know. And that's the kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Also, also, I'd love... Did you did you know um, that they rewrote Cheryl's history and revealed that Louise was not Lou's child and that she'd had an affair and covered it up? Did not know this. That's outrageous. Yeah. I've been saying this was present every year. And, and, yet... and yet he's claiming to be the father of my daughter. I don't know what to say, Lou. I really don't. I mean, that Lonnie could be anyone else's child, but yours is just, well, it's unbelievable. Not to this bloke. That's outrageous. <laughs> Why don't they tell us? <laughs> oh. I'm, telling, I'm telling Danny as well. <laughs> you do. Well, I, I would love Brett to come back just to write that wrong and say, actually, you know what? Louise is Lou's child. Cheryl yeah. is not a liar and a cheat. So this was a storyline that came in what after Cheryl had passed, or yeah, yeah, yeah. She wasn't even around to defend herself. They just no, completely the kind of threw her character under the bus. And all, all the years Cheryl and I were together. I mean, if she did it once, had an affair. Oh, Lou, come on! I'm not. Yeah, surely you can see my stuff. idea is the best. Just ignore the letter. Ignore it completely. Crazy. We didn't believe it. We didn't believe it. We weren't having any of it. It was how they wrote out um, the girl that played Louise. Yeah. Well, she was, wasn't she on Australia's Idol as well? When, when she yes. Was a little bit she older. was a singer, yeah. Yes. X Factor or something, yeah. Right. No, I know this. I love that you reminded me of it all, but I'm like, I'm, I'm not actually, I'm generally like, oh, that's right. Because yeah, I, I forgot. And then you've reminded me. This is true. Yeah. Well, did you know, did you never fancy a little foreign to the pop world? <laughs> like some of the other neighbours are looking uh, Look, I, I loved singing when I was a kid. And um, even in between Neighbours and I might have even actually been just after Neighbours. There was a band here called Human Nature. <laughs> Producers, they were wanting to like get come up with a new boy band, and I was really keen. I was like, oh, yeah. human nature. Yeah, they're huge. They were fantastic, Steffi. Um, and so I heard about them auditioning, and then I I went into then I, I was like, I really want to see the person. Really want to see the person. So they they asked me to come in, and then I remember being in the office, and then the lady behind the reception, she goes, oh, I guess they really want to know. Like what? Why? Why do you want to do this? Why would you want? To, and I was, I was like, oh, I've always just dreamed of being in a boy band ever since I was a kid. And when this opportunity, I see a lot of human nature, and I'd love to do that. And then outside of this door was the producer. He was like, "Good answer, come in." And so we came in, and then he was like, "You know, you've just got to record this song, um, and uh, let me know, let you know, see how you go. It doesn't matter the quality of it. I just want to hear the basic one." And I was like, "Yeah, cool." And so I went home and I learned it. And about three days later, I put it down and recorded it. And, I didn't hear a thing, you know. They were just oh. like, <laughs> um, I don't know if the thing ever happened or not. Like, I don't think I have a terrible voice. Um, with every step I thought of you, and day by day my love is true. But what I'd really like I'm to say, you told me now, I'm don't you? Don't pass. I've even, um, with, with uh, Kim's husband, um, they actually used one of my songs on an album that they released, Zero, which was all about um, violence against children and not necessarily what Kim's doing now, but with women, but with children. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a terrible A songwriter or B singer, but yes, didn't hear anything back from that. And that was like oh. devastated. Quite often look back and go, that could have been a boy band. Let's be serious. Maybe <laughs> not 47, but um, back then I would have definitely eaten that up. Yeah. So somewhere out there is a, a lost pop song recorded by yourself. 
We've got them, right? a copy of it. We can leak it online and we can do a big campaign to get it to number one. <laughs> it was on a CD because I'd written it on piano, but it was like basic chords and I couldn't even say what the chords were. But I went to do a voiceover and the guy actually was into music as well. And so I was just playing on piano. He goes, it's really pretty. And I was like, oh, thanks. And he was like, go get a cup of tea. What are the chords? And I was like, these two. No, there was a few chords here and a few chords there. And then I came back and then he'd, he'd just... Because he's a musician, believe it or not, it sounded 20 times better than what I could ever do. And then he was like, let's give it a go, just record it. And so I put the headphones on and then he played it and recorded it. And he went a bit long, so I just had to make some bits up at the end. And then he was like, oh, it's actually quite good, mate. And so then he gave me the CD and I remember listening to it in my disc man on the way home. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I am amazing. <laughs> and I showed <laughs> everybody. Yeah, and my mum, I wanted to play it. She goes, I don't want to hear it. And, mom was like, and then my sister was like, just let him hear it. Just let him play it, mum. It's good. And then I did, and she was like, oh, it's great. Um, <laughs> and it was called Remedy. I don't know. I don't even know how to get it. I think some people still have it on the CD, but the recording that we got on, on that CD, there's like little things at the end that sounds like bees. We call it the bees because it goes da -da 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 at the very end. So some people still talk about that CD with the da -da 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 and your song. Oh, uh -huh. Yeah. Jason well, Hurtman, if you're listening, if you're watching, next time we need to revamp the theme tune, he is your man. I am your man. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> the classic version. <laughs> the version yeah. we all love. <laughs> the campaign starts here. That's it. Yes. Well, I'm glad we've brought back a lot of um, comedy moments from you. And um, um, it's been an absolute delight from uh, two huge super goony fans to, to speak to. <laughs> Um, like an OG Stark, it's like it's it's incredible. So thank you so much for coming on and like blessing us with all your stories and your memories of of the show. But no, I think that was that was great. It was good, like fun for me to think back at stuff as well, and just to be openly and uh, you know unadulterated in the way that I sort of express myself and and you know remember the really fun time that I had on the show. It was so. It was so cool and it's just so cool that there's still an army of fans out there that remember things and often more than me and I know that that was the case you would run into people and they're like do you remember when you did this and you said that and I was like wow um, um we don't forget we don't forget yeah I love that honestly that was really <laughs> nice thank um, god people have memories for me just to end on that where can the fans find you no, I don't mean give you home address or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> my number is. Um, uh, I think my name's on Instagram and, like, I don't use it very often. You'll probably only, only see one photo on there. Um, and I think that's how we've been chatting too, so I do apologise because I tend to only jump on every five days and I'm like, oh. Um, and I, I'm on the book face, of course, as well. But, um, but, but yeah, that's probably, it's a pretty unique last name as well. But, um, yeah, they can. So reach out and say hi. I'll say hi back. Thank you so much, Brett. It's been an absolute joy. Thank you. Legends. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Do you ever feel like a plastic bag Drifting through the wind Wanting to start again Do you ever feel this so paper thin Like a house of cards One blow from caving in chance for you, cause there's a spark in you, you just gotta ignite the light, and let it shine, just oh.